All right, here we are with John Thorne. John, thanks so much. Good to see you. Good seeing you. Glad to be yeah. here. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. So I, I wanted to just start off with some recent news. Uh, it's it's a 30th anniversary of Wrapped in Plastics launch, I believe. And I personally own no copies. I do, have, <laughs> I, do I think, have all your books, and I'm a big fan of your writing. So do you think, uh, you think I should purchase some Wrapped in Plastic copies, or do I kind of have it covered? Well, uh, thank you uh, for the compliment <laughs> and uh, thank you for buying the books. Um, yeah, Wrapped in Plastic, you know, we did 75 issues and, um, you know, ran for 13 years uh, from 92 to 2005. Um, I tried to, when I made my first book, which is essentially the, um, you know, compilation of all the, the, the important Twin Peaks material from, uh, from those issues, um, lots of material, of course, is not in, in the book. So, um, you know, if we did an interview with like Miguel Ferrer, for example, mm. uh, I only used the interview material that had to do with Twin Peaks. We talked to him about a lot of different things and uh, just same as, you know, true with so many of the actors. Uh, so just for the interviews, um, and there's interviews with people who weren't in Twin Peaks. Uh, so uh, you know, there's that, and there's lots of articles that are in Wrapped in Plastic that um, were contributed by other writers and uh, stuff that we did about uh, Mark Frost's work, David Lynch's work. So there's a lot of material in those issues. Um, I don't know how easy they are to track down. Uh, some yeah. of them are harder to get now. So eBay, I guess, <laughs> is your best shot. And I, find, I could recommend, you know, some issues versus others are worth getting. Yeah, um, maybe later I'll ask you for certain issues, but uh, sure. At, at sure. the rate at the rate I'm going, I only started watching Twin Peaks in 2020, so I'm very very late to the party. But at the rate I'm going, I'll, I'll probably snatch up everything I can get. Um, but I think tonight mostly we're going to be talking about the return uh, with the focus on your newest book, and uh, uh, I've I've told you on a couple occasions I'm a I'm a big, big admirer of that book. I think it's a huge accomplishment. Um, it's such a like massive show. It's a, you said it was going to take you a year. Apparently, it took you four. So, what's up with that? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I didn't know what uh, uh, how long it would take. I knew I had to write about it. I knew yeah. I wouldn't be done. Well, I'm not going to be done, done. But I knew that if I didn't address it, if I didn't write about it, that there would be this big gap in my um relationship with Twin Peaks mm. over the decades and so I felt compelled to write about it and I wasn't quite sure I was pretty scared to be honest with you mm. I wasn't quite sure at the beginning what I could do what you know if I could make sense of any of it some of it was pretty baffling and and then I thought well I'll just write my way through it I, I kind of talk about this a little bit in the book I'll just mm. sort of comment on it and it'll be like a, like an audio commentary on a on a DVD and that wasn't sufficient. I knew I needed to do more. And then so as I wrote, I realized I needed to do more. And um, yeah, what turned started is I thought it would take a year to a year. It took close to four years to do. And um, so yeah. Um, so the result is my book. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully, you know, people will find some value in it. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to get into like a little bit of the content of the book, but uh, probably even more so, um, a little bit about your approach. Uh, I, I teach middle school and high school students. Uh, yeah. School full time and high school as a tutor. And uh, one of the main things that they're developing at this point in their career is their like analytical skills. So right. it's interesting. I'm not sure if you think back to eighth grade or so where you were <laughs> analytically, but but it's interesting really to, to track somebody who's successfully like tackled this material because this material is really difficult. And, and uh, I noticed that there are, some, there are some things that you brought to your analysis that I had never heard of. And I think a lot of readers or a lot of watchers of the show never heard of, and they allowed you to maybe unlock certain perspectives. So on the one hand, I, I, like, I'm glad that you I guess, share those lenses with us through your book. And on the other hand, uh, if you don't mind, I just want to start with just some basic like analysis type questions. Sure. Uh, yeah. And starting with, could you have done this 
say, mm -hmm. did you have the skill set to do this 25 years ago <laughs> to tackle the return? Uh, uh, 25 years ago, um, I would might have been able to do it. And I say that only because um, I, Twin Peaks, the original show, um, sort of propelled me into my graduate work. Okay. Uh, I, I, I went back to graduate school after Twin Peaks at Air because I was interested in television and I was interested in television production. And it was during that course of study that I became interested in what's called narrative theory. I did my thesis on the television series Homicide, which was drawn a long, long time ago, uh, which was one of my favorite shows at the time. And I deliberately chose that because I was too close to Twin Peaks. I wanted something that I could step back from a little bit and, and, and take a little more objectively. But anyway, I studied what's called narrative theory. And narrative theory is, is basically study of how we tell stories, uh, you know, what a story is and how we present a story to someone, whether it's in uh, text uh, as a book, uh, which is where narrative theory kind of grew out of. But there's been a lot of study of narrative theory in film and television um, because there's sort of, there's obviously, there's sound and visual elements uh, there. And because um, when you're telling a story on film and television, unlike a book, it's running at its own rate. And so you really don't have necessarily the luxury of stopping it, uh, certainly when you're watching a movie in a theater. Uh, and going back and re, you know watching a scene, you, you can do that now at home video. But but anyway, um, so so it's a long answer to your question. I, I started studying narrative theory theory in the late nineties and uh, and early two thousands. So I think that's when honestly I started to feel confident in my writing about Twin Peaks, and it it was it was then in those years that I started writing what I think are my better essays about the original show and about Firewalk with Me, uh, and uh, so so I guess you know it's kind of a silly answer to your question. There was certainly a time I could not have done it, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but it sounds like you had a lot of raw material as a fan and like a you know as a pretty passionate fan of the show, and then you acquired maybe. Uh, I guess you maybe you rounded out or added on to your formal skill set through your graduate work and then returned to Twin Peak Peaks, I guess maybe a little more armed. Would would you say yeah, that's anchored? Yeah. Or? Yes, definitely. I mean, I like, you know, I like to read uh, good, informative uh, essays about film and television. Um, and one of the things we tried to do in Wrapped in Plastic was because I, I like an academic essay. But what I don't like is an academic essay that makes me really work hard to read it, where it's using, you know, terminology that most people don't understand. It's assuming, you know, all this theory that you probably never heard of before. Mm -hmm. And so what we tried to do in, in the magazine was to write essentially academic essays. These are informed research works, but written in a way that are somewhat readable. You know, you yeah. can kind of read it and 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 you're carried along by what, you know, by what the theory is, but also about um, also what the content, you know, what the, the, the topic is. And that's what we tried to do in the magazine. That's what I try to do when I write even, you know, now is make it accessible because yeah. there's some fascinating, you know, there's some that's fascinating theory there and you can make it really hard to understand and, and uh, or you can try to, to work it, you know, making it easier to understand. And so that's been the, certainly my effort is to try to provide well-researched, grounded theoretical uh, approaches to something, but also make it kind of interesting, lively, readable. Uh, I don't know if I've succeeded at that, but that's definitely been my, my, my goal. Yeah, that's great. And there, you know, there are people who do like reading that stuff for fun and yes do, uh, do like reading those types of essays for fun you know not for not for school not for grades for right. simulation and i think twin peaks fans probably skew a little heavily in that direction um, yeah it kind of draws that kind of crowd um and and i will say that i love the book you know and i've read different sections of it but it's a it's a lot you know, it's dense. <laughs> yeah. the show is dense. There's a lot of a lot of concepts that I think you succeeded at not making too academic. 
and yet the just the material itself is a little bit abstract, including some of the uh, some of the concepts. So I hope to get into that in a little bit. But sure. uh, just just broadly, uh, how's the reception been for the new book? Uh, pretty good, and I will say maybe a little better than I expected. Oh. And I guess maybe I was a bit. When you're writing it, and I've said this before in other interviews, you're by yourself with it, and you don't know what other people are going to think. And um, I could perceive people wanting to throw the book across the room, you know, because some of the some of the ideas I put forth, I, I you know, I have I have certain theories that I propose that I think are supported by the text, and they may not be what other people. And this has happened to me before in other essays. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what people want to hear or, you know, what they felt about the work. I try to keep that in mind when I'm writing because I do think it's important to honor all people's opinions and not try to force an idea on someone. What I want to do is try to, is try to guide someone through an idea and say, look, here's a way of looking at it, certainly with, with the support of theory and research and the text itself. So, um, so the response has been, there's been some, some good reviews I've read, uh, you know, a few on Amazon and, and then uh, people have tweeted out some thing, very nice things. And um, it's very, you know, it really is gratifying. It really makes me feel good uh, that I've reached some people. Um, that's what I like about a book about one of my favorite films or whatever. It's just like, mm. oh, we're kind of sharing the work again. We're sharing it, we're, you know, what we liked about it. And um, opening a few doors, maybe get, get you know getting some new ideas out there. So, again, a long answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, uh, I I made like a kind of half-hearted attempt to maybe even start like a little discussion group, and then uh, I'm like, well, that's not happening. Let me just try to let me just try to talk to John himself. So, I figured that might be better. I have yeah. a I have a question I've been wanting to ask you. Um, have you like? Uh, did you learn anything about yourself or did you like develop in any way through the course of working on this book? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, mm. without a doubt. I think, um, you know, this really gets into the, into the, the material. Um, writing about, uh, about the character of Dale Cooper, whom I think in The Return is far more present than might be um, obvious, and I think is being presented to us in this new Twin Peaks as someone who is struggling, who is flawed, who is trying to overcome some self-imposed barriers. All of that made me think about myself and about how you know you perceive the world and what is important to you and what what is driving you and what is getting in the way of success, whatever, however you want to define that. And um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, and obviously I get into a little bit of the Hindu philosophy, which was new to me, and I found some very appealing material there. Uh, I know, I know very little about it, <laughs> but, yeah. but some of, of the, the Hindu approach to, to living your life, I thought made some sense. And um, I've tried to kind of see the world and accept the world a little differently um, uh, now than perhaps before I wrote the book. And that's all because of my research and, mm. and, and what I think David Lynch is trying to convey to us in the, in the return. So yes, um, I think I'm a little different. <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to just trans transition a little bit into some of your methodology or some of your methods. And if you want to Sure. Answer, if you want to answer certain things or not, that's okay. But uh, uh, I'll start light. You've, you've said this a number of times, and maybe even in the book, um, reading or writing your way toward the truth is an expression you like to use. And uh, so, like, what does that mean to you? Well, it's, it's interesting to me is that sometimes I have an idea about uh, a, a concept or a, an idea in Twin Peaks or, or I don't. <laughs> and I sit down and I write about it and I kind of let my thoughts flow. And I think about, I, I try to be as honest as I can with the work too. You know, I don't want to force it to go in any particular direction. And, um, 
And it is often, it has often happened that while I'm writing, I will make a discovery. It will happen in the moment mm. while the pen is, is passing across the page. For example, I can give you an example. Yeah. And, and that is when I was writing the, I think I call it, I'm a lonely soul or a lonely soul essay. And it was the essay about Cooper's soul trapped in the red room. And I was writing about Cooper and I was writing about him uh, his soul and I just it just I just remember the one armed man saying when I saw the face of God I was changed mm. and uh, and the idea that that you know Dougie might be um, uh, an, an angelic figure uh, all of those ideas I didn't think about them when I started the essay if that makes any sense you yeah, sure, sure. those things sort of coalesce as you're going and then you realize, oh, this maybe is the core of what I wanted to write about. Then you go back and you start reworking, you know, to, to kind of make it a more smoother essay. Yeah. But those ideas sometimes don't come until you're, until you're literally in that moment of, of just putting words down, letting the words come out when you're writing. Not that they just come out all the time, yeah, too. Sure. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of times where I'm pulling my hair and I can't get to something, you have to walk away from it. But but that's what I mean when I'm right I'm, I'm writing and, 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 you know, a lot of times too, I will say, um, I write myself to a dead end. I will write and uh, there's nothing there. And you can't be afraid to do that because you are going to throw a lot of stuff away. But, um, but you also know now what not to focus on, which there is value to writing a bunch of stuff that you throw away. So, uh, so, you know, and again, it's just, um, I guess maybe some people say, well, you need to outline, sit down and outline and figure it all out. And I get that. But for me, it's more right and, and see kind of where it's going to go. Is there, is there anything you do to stay disciplined? Uh, like, like, uh, to discipline yourself or to discipline your arguments or your analysis? Or is it just, I, it shows you it's, it shows you it's dead end when it gets there. Like, is there anything you do to try to avoid uh, illusions or delusions or anything like that, <laughs> especially when the energy is high? Uh, well, I guess when it comes to discipline, I mean, if you're feeling mm -hmm. the writing, then try to keep going. Don't, you know, don't stop if you can if you if you are if your life allows for that it yeah. doesn't always there are lots of things in life that get in the way yes. um uh, you know i i uh, one thing i would recommend to writers is don't write well you know, for me it, it's all different everyone's yeah. different if i'm writing late at night uh then i can't get to sleep <laughs> you know i can't I can't relax. I found that I would cut myself off at 9 p.m. I would kind of force myself to, to stop, even if things were going pretty well. I, what I would do if things were going pretty well is I'd start making notes. I'd start mm -hmm. bulleting, go here, go here, go here, go here, go here, um, and then stop. And again, go watch some TV and then, and then read for a while. Because if I would write till like 11.30 or midnight, which I would do sometimes, then I'd go to bed. Well, forget it. I'm up till two or three, just laying in bed. Yeah. And that's not good. Um, I mean, these are kind of nitty gritty qu answers to no, your that's question. Great because um, sometimes, sometimes when you're going and watching TV or having a snack or, or uh, even reading something else in the background, sometimes you, your thoughts are sort of coalescing or do, dancing around or doing something uh, rather than keeping you awake. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing I did try to do in those instances, like I said, is you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to stop when you're right on the verge of something either, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So obviously, you know, it's, a, it's, a, you know, if you're, if I, I can go another half an hour to make sure I got this point down, but, um, but yeah, but then, you know, when you kind of have it, you know, kind of know where you're going to go, you can then stop. I, and, and some people, it might be different, you know, they might be better, um, uh, in, at night, who knows, but, yeah. um, um, well, I'm, gonna I'm have not sure to, they answered all of your question. But. Yeah, that's great. Um, but I'm going to have to twiddle my fingers for the next question. So, okay. But, uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Feel, feel thinking, the concept of feel thinking, which is a, a phrase we all know. Uh, like, mm -hmm. what does that mean to you? Is that a part of your approach at all? 
Yeah, well, of course, that comes from David Lynch, where he talks about, um, I think it was specifically from an interview where he was talking about Mulholland Drive, where he said, you know, a lot of it, you know, fits together and makes sense, but some of it you have to kind of feel, think. And I think, well, you know, it's difficult with Lynch on assigning what that means, but, it, you know, Lynch believes in intuition and believes in the idea that it, it makes, if it, you'll know if it makes sense. Um, and so I think that that applies to to some of what I when I'm writing, you know, the idea that just and that you know, kind of fits with what I was saying before is that you you're, you're writing, you're letting it flow out of you, so you're mm. feeling it, and then you'll know maybe a little bit after the fact you start to think about you know this isn't making sense, um, so. So you got to be open to being able to sort of f let it flow, feel it, and then um, you kind of just know if it's going in the right direction or not. So an example would be one that did not work for me mm. was writing about Gordon Cole and Gordon Cole talking about the whole backstory of of uh, Cooper and and uh, Cooper's plan that he put together with Major Briggs. Now, part of this is due to the fact that I think that Fro Mark Frost and David Lynch were working somewhat at odds here when Lynch finally came to filming The Return. Um, I, I wrote a lot of that, out, tried to figure out what the backstory mm -hmm. was, and it and and I had an idea. I thought I think I, I think I know. And the more I wrote, the less it made sense. And so, but I had to do that. I had to write it out. And then, uh, then I was in a quandary because I'm like, what am I going to do here? I could include all that in the book and just say, it doesn't make sense. Or I could not include it in the book and say, if you think about this really hard, it doesn't make sense and not go into, into too much, you know, overwhelm with too much data. Um, and that's what I ended up doing uh, ultimately. Yeah. But um, uh, so, so I, you know, again, it, it, it's kind of, you've got to, yeah, you kind of got to let, you got to feel, <laughs> feel think is such a funny term. Yeah. Um, you you got to kind of open yourself to the text and see how the text is, is working for you. And I think if it's a successful text, um, that is uh, the writer and the director really do have a grasp of their material. Then I think if you open yourself to it, you will also feel uh, that it works for you, makes some intuitive sense to you. And, uh, and so that's the feeling part of it. And then, and then just trying to encapsulate that in words is the thinking part. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that makes yeah. sense. No, thanks. Yeah, that, that's, actually, that's actually a good answer. And a little bit helpful as well. So for, for oh, something else I've been thinking about, um, and it's it's hard it's hard to make that happen uh, in like a middle school classroom. So I'm sure. gonna, I'm going to say like middle school essay prompts or analysis mm. prompts are often mm -hmm. they're often rather structured. They'll be like something like a, you know analyze the theme and maybe like three techniques the author uses in conjunction to develop the theme. Mm -hmm. High school, you might get something like, here are three different lenses, apply one of these lenses to X text. And then, mm -hmm. you know, college, grad school, etc. sometimes there's nothing at all. It's like kind of start from scratch. Here's your, yeah. do something with it. And I imagine, I imagine uh, your approach with your book and to the return, it was starting from scratch. Here's the text, do something with it. Is that kind of... True. Like, how do you how do you grapple with something that huge? Well, okay, I did have some experience with Twin Peaks for a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd written yeah. about Twin Peaks so much and had interviewed so many of the actors and David Lynch and Mark Frost and, and Harley Payton and Robert Engels. I immersed myself and and I watched so much Lynch work, so I kind of immersed myself in it. I kind of felt I knew how Lynch approached the work what was important to him and so those things were already there mm. and I even before the return started I was thinking all about it like what's David Lynch going to do with this and I, I was pretty certain honestly that it was going to be an internal story it was going to be a story about 
someone struggling with themselves because that's really most of what Lynch's work is. Okay. So, so I feel like I had maybe, you know, I was a few steps ahead, at least in terms of, you know, if somebody came in brand new and they didn't know Lynch's yeah. work, that's a pretty tough place to be. So I had decades of that. And, that, um, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Was that, yeah. uh, was that a crutch at all? Or was that like a uh, potential block having so much background knowledge? I mean, obviously you need uh, background knowledge, but like having hunches, predictions, did any of that stuff? Well, okay, off? yeah, that's a good question because one thing, even though I had hunches and predictions, mm -hmm. uh, I remember talking to this on many interviewers before the show came on, was I tried to clear my mind and ex expect just about anything to happen in, in Twin Peaks The Return, you know, that, that it could very well be that they were just going to tell the story again. It was going to start all over again with the murder of Laura Palmer. You know, I, that's just an example. Yeah. I tried to be as open as I could to it, you know, with the very general idea that knowing Lynch, it would probably somehow, well, two things I expected, I guess, it would be a, about an internal, ultimately about someone at odds with themselves. And that at some point in the story, it was going to flip. It, like, it was going to be very confusing. Mm -hmm. you know, we were going to be like, okay, what? We, Scott Ryan and I called it the Mulholland Drive moment. I don't know if you're familiar with Mulholland yeah, Drive. Yeah, you watch sure. two hours of the movie. It looks <laughs> like it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. And then something flips and everything's inverted. And you ultimately have to reassess the first two hours. I thought there would be that. And there was, except it happened in hour 18 <laughs> of a, of a uh, well, you know, 17 plus hours into an 18 hour story. So um, that was a little surprising, more than a little surprising. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to zoom out just a tad. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, this is kind of more coming from a teacher perspective, a teacher yeah. perspective, because whenever I could sn steal little snippets, uh, I try to, I mean, even from people who are working at a high level, is there like a, what is challenging about analysis to you? Uh, analyzing Twin Peaks and maybe analyzing Twin Peaks The Return in particular, like what just jumps out as just challenging? Um, wow, I guess you could well, take any of, the, any of those three questions would be fine. Um, well, I think the biggest challenging thing about Twin Peaks, I'm going to have to get specific here mm -hmm. um i don't know if i can answer it generally um you know a lot of people struggle with all of lynch's work this idea of of yeah, well it's all a dream it's a dream it's all inside the mind of someone and and there is some um examples of that i think in lynch's work where it was probably a dream or, or parts of it were a dream um and so you find some analysts fall back on that somewhat as the um, uh, explanation for some of the crazy, odd, bizarre things. And I felt that while I have written about dream theories before and feel strongly about them in other, uh, other contexts, mm -hmm. um, I felt like the struggle here was how do I, how do I, um, look at this work and not dismiss it as a dream because I felt like there was a value to these other characters, this other story, the story, you know, there's value to the, the, the story of the log lady and that she dies. Uh, you know, if that is not quote unquote real within the story, then I, it seems to lose some value to me, but there's all this other stuff that's going on. That's very hard to, um, to reconcile without it being just sort of randomness. Uh, and, and so when I got, I'm getting very specific here, when I found some of the Hindu information and the Hindu teachings and, and, and learned a little bit more about that, that helped me come up with an idea that I thought helped explain some of the very confusing elements of the return. Um, that's a very specific answer. Uh, yeah. In a more general, in a more general, I guess, uh, way, it was a very long story. It was 18 hours long, and uh, certainly on the first few exposures to it, 
it was really hard to get my hands around something that long to keep in mind things that were happening in parts 15 and 16 when I'm watching parts two and three. Yeah. And so one thing that happened that I didn't expect was that I saw a structure to the story, which was this three act structure. And once I saw that for me, then I could get my hands around it a lot. I said, okay, I've got an act here. Yeah. And I can look at that kind of by itself. And I've got an act here. So I started breaking it down. Get a little manageable. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's true of a, a long book, of, of a long, it, it really it doesn't have to be long. It can be a short movie. If there's a lot of going on in it, if you can start breaking it down and seeing how the pieces fit together, what leads to what, then you get a little more comfortable with the work. So that was a challenge for, for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'd like to get into some of those, a couple different frameworks that at least I assume were kind of at the heart of your book, in addition to your own, you know, to your own sort of independent thinking. Uh, so would you, first of all, would you agree that uh, Seymour Chapman and his work with covert nar narrators and Brian Rourke and his kind of concept of the fractured maybe the fractured mm -hmm. narrator or protagonist mm -hmm. and then some of the Vedas, like, would you say those were your three primary sort of frameworks or lenses or tools that you brought to bear on the return or, or maybe not? Well, yes. I mean, the, the Chapman stuff was stuff that I had studied years and years ago. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I watch anything, I kind of try to look at it in terms of how, um, you know, not to get too, again, not too detailed, but. No, please do. I you see a story, I shouldn't say a story, a film or a book or a television series, what's happening is there's two things that go on. There's a story and, and there's discourse. A story is just what happened. You know, Bob went out to pick up some groceries and along the way, he found this million dollars in a bush and then he was attacked by, you know, some criminals who chased him and However it ends, it ends. That's the story. Mm. The discourse is how you tell that story. You could tell that story from Bob's point of view. You can tell that story from the guys who were chasing him's point of view. You can tell it in flashbacks. You can, uh, you know, you can tell it with a narrator. You could tell it Bob's narrating it <laughs> or there's an omniscient, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's the discourse. And the discourse is, is, a way of telling a story. And I find that fascinating. Mm. How do we tell a story? How do we involve the viewer in the, what we're telling? Because you could tell you, I could tell you a story that sounds extremely boring, but I could show it to you in a way that you can't stop watching it. And that's fascinating to me. And that's what the Seymour Chapman book is all about. Um, and he basically is, is analyzing books and, and, you know, written work. But again, there's a lot to do with film. Um, the, the Brian Rourke stuff, which is in, which about Inland Empire, which was the can film. I, can I just stop you just for a second? And I'm sorry for yeah. that. Um, no. Can you just get into a little bit the distinction, unless you want to wait, the distinction between uh, Chapman's covert narrator versus like a, an omniscient narrator? Because sure. they seem to have maybe more in common than they don't have in common, but there's definitely a difference. Yeah, and again, I, I, I will say that I'm not a total expert on this. Mm. So I think an omniscient narrator is a narrator that uh, is, is somewhat reliable and is, telling, is just sort of telling the story from a remove. Um, a covert narrator is probably a little more involved in the story, uh, is someone uh, or a potentially a character in the story. Mm. Um, but but hidden. And so you don't necessarily realize that, that the story you're hearing is being told from a biased point of view. Um, the omniscient narrator may be a little more, well, there's a difference between reliable and unreliable narrators yeah, as sure. well. And it gets very confusing here, but in a, you know, a reliable narrator is someone you can trust. They're gonna tell you the story and they're gonna tell it to you the best of their ability and you can believe what they're saying. Mm -hmm. An unreliable narrator has an agenda and is probably telling the story for their own benefit, which is fascinating yes. because as you get to later parts of the story, you begin to realize, I've got to reevaluate what I saw. And I, that is fascinating mm. to me. That's a little different between omniscient and covert. Omniscient yeah. narrator is just someone who may be able to bring in elements of the story 
uh, that are happening in different parts of the world or different parts of the universe or different times and is just essentially assembling it for you and telling it to you. A covert narrator is someone who's sort of hidden within the discourse. It, you don't even know necessarily they're narrating it or they're telling it to you until un, 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 you may never know, which is a possibility, mm. but you may be able to determine that there's, there's something else going on. It gets a little confusing. It's, yeah. it's difficult concepts. I'm not sure I I'm not sure I clarified it any. No, I think, I think you're explaining it. Really, I think you're explaining it really well. I also think somebody without your training would would not think that at all when watching the return, um, or maybe maybe stumble upon the idea, you know. Um, so, and that's that's really great. That was one of the things that I really appreciated about the book. And mostly, you're saying that uh, Dale Cooper is the covert narrator, but but not always. Does anybody else slip into that role? Um, well, I would say that anything that was, uh, that for the most part, we are seeing the story as Dale Cooper is watching it. Now, the difference here, and this is really gets specific and, and, and I don't know, drive, drive all your viewers away, but yeah. the covert narrator is actively telling us the story. The covert narrator is involved. Dale Cooper's a little bit different, I think, the way Lynch is presenting him. He's covert in that we don't see him, and he's sort of hidden. But I also think what Lynch is trying to do is that we're trying to experience it as Cooper is experiencing it. So he's not necessarily skewing it for his own benefit or his own agenda, leaving parts out that he doesn't want us to know. Um, I think he's just sort of watching it and we are watching it as if we are him that that is subtle and it, it, it but there is a distinction there uh so that's what i was trying to get at as if cooper's kind of watching all this transpire and we are seeing it as he sees it so when there's something that's confusing it's probably confusing him as well you know something that we see on screen is confusing but anyway all that to say i do think that lynch found it necessary to move outside of that point of view on occasion when he was telling us the story. And, and he signals that to us through black and white imagery. So that things that are happening in black and white are probably not being shown to us through Cooper's filter. They're mm. potentially more reliable. So that when Andy goes to see the fireman, Cooper's not really watching that. When we go back in time in 1956, 1945, in part eight, when we see the Trinity explosion and the, all those things that transpire, I don't think Cooper's aware of that. I think that that's new story material that the viewer needs to know about in order to process mm. the larger story. So another long answer, but yeah, no, um, interesting. But that's what I think. It's, I also think funny, it's, also funny, it's also funny to say when Andy visits the fireman, <laughs> <That's Yeah. laughs> probably something that's really happening, yes. Well, I mean, that so was in the world of the story. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, it's just funny that that's a, that's like the first example of, okay, maybe this is reliable now. <laughs> well, yeah. Isn't that true? Uh, yet yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, well, I mean, it, it, to me, it made sense as I, you know, looked at later parts of the story that Andy is a crucial player and perhaps a substitute for what Cooper was supposed to do. And the fireman has a plan. He's sort of a larger figure who's who's trying to make his plan come together. And anyway, this is getting into very nitty gritty stuff. So, yeah. so, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, there are elements of the story that are outside of Cooper's perspective. And um, yeah, so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's interesting. It is, it's hard to manage. Yes, okay. without a doubt. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it slipped away from me, I think. Um, I'm the first to admit it. Um, I tried not to force it, you know, and say, hey, look, I've got this theory. It's 100% right. So there were times where it, even though it fit, I think, 90% of the work, it doesn't always seem to work for me. And I tried to be honest about that in the book and say, I don't know what's going on here. I, I can't make it make sense. Um, so rather than try to foist, foist my opinion on you at that point or yeah. try to, I wanted to admit it and say, 
I, I don't really know what what's happening here. Um, so 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 Ch Chapman's idea, uh, like indirectly or otherwise, was it was with you as you approached the return. It wasn't like you had, it wasn't like you were trying to study the return and then remembered him and then had like an aha moment. <laughs> I, I know the, uh, I know when you were talking with Cameron uh, Cloutier mm -hmm. about the, uh, like the Laura plot line and the Kalki stuff mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the influence of the Vedic texts. You said you had a bit of a, maybe a bit of an aha moment when you were reading. Oh yeah. Okay, so that one yeah, was a clear so, cut I mean, wow moment for you. Yeah, I did not know uh, how to make sense of part eight. I mean, when, when we see Laura essentially being, again, I'm putting my definitions around it. Somebody might read it differently. That, the, you know, I say the fireman is creating Laura Palmer and sending her to Earth. Well, you could, I suppose, there's many ways to interpret what's happening. What we're seeing right. on the screen could be something else. Um, and, you know, I'm sure someone could write some with great theory behind it. Uh, so, so the Laura Palmer story was an element of the return, uh, I think is sort of out. It's crucial to the overall story of Dale Cooper, but it is, um, it's another story within the story that we have to have some sensibility about. And, and I didn't know when I started writing, or I shouldn't say when I started writing, when I started researching, I mean, it took a, you know, months and months and months of, of, of watching it and taking notes and, and thinking about it and, and processing it and talking to people about it, which is crucial, I think, is to yeah. have discussions with other people. Um, I, you know, trying to come to, to some sense of what is happening with Laura, and I, I did. And when I did, uh, for me, made sense for me, uh, then I was like, okay. And I wrote an essay. Uh, which ended up in the Blue Rose, and I presented it at a Twin Peaks conference last year uh, that I felt really, really good about. I was like, yeah, this is, this is sort of a core element. Um, but with that essay, with that idea, you, you do have to find the data to back it up. You've got to find, do some research. You can't just say, it looks like this, and so it is. I looked into what Lynch's beliefs are. I looked into Lynch's interviews and I found uh, enough that supported my thesis. And so just getting back to your first question with Chapman, I didn't go into writing the book with Chapman in mind necessarily. Mm -hmm. I had knew all about it. I was writing about Dale Cooper's perspective and Dale Cooper as, a, as sort of a covert character. And I realized well, I, I need to make sure I include theory here. I need to, to research that supports this because anyone can throw a theory out about Twin Peaks and a lot of people do. But you, you do need to kind of say more about that idea than simply, I like it. <laughs> you know, you have to, you have to dig in and say, how does it work? And so that's what the theory is, is critical in that respect. Yeah, I see. So, so you had, you had kind of like your idea about the Laura and fireman angle. And then when you learned about the 10th avatar and Vishnu mm -hmm. and Kalki that solidified it. So that was the order, right? Like you kind of were thinking of, along those lines anyway. And then, yeah, and and the log lady. Uh, not that this is a huge deal. It's just a curiosity that I had, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um. Uh, the sort of the pieces sort of came together. Um. <laughs> it, you know, one was over here and one was over here, and then I I didn't realize it, that they, they that they were related. So, you know, um. Again, I told the story. I'll make it real quick. I yeah. I was fascinated with what stuff the log lady was saying to Hawk in part ten. I researched that. I saw this Hindu ideas in there, bought a book about, you know, Hindu theology and was reading about it. And then I, that's when I saw Kalki, the 10th Avatar, the white horse. I'm like, well, okay. Oh, 10 is the number of completion. You know, it was sort of like clues that sort of fell into place. And, um, and then I felt like I could, I could, they coalesced and I could assemble them into a linear argument and and that's what i did i see yeah yeah cool 
Um, Brian Rourke is another person that you reference in the book. Uh, it, if you don't mind, I'm just going to share my screen. Sure. Um, okay, so over here on the left uh, is a very <laughs> interesting quote about Inland Empire. On the right, we have these are sort of these are quotations from your book, but they're mostly kind of things that other people might say. Uh, yes. Both of them are dealing with the fact that Lynch's <laughs> Lynch's work is is tough. Yeah, is tough to unpack. So can you just talk a little bit about uh, Brian Rourke's influence? Yeah, you know, I didn't realize that Rourke, that stuff was out there until I was well into the book. And this happens a lot, you know, is um, I felt that Inland Empire was an important work because it was the last work that Lynch had done. And I just saw some stuff in Inland Empire that was happening again in The Return. Mm. Um, and so I just looked for as many academic essays on Inland Empire as I could find and, and found that one. And, and you don't know, sometimes, you know, it's, it's sort of, um, it, it's, it's a treasure hunt in, yeah. in, in a way. You, you don't know if it's going to be of any use to you. There's a lot, this is what research is, I guess, right? So you read a bunch of essays and, and many of them, unfortunately, don't add to your argument. They don't subtract. They just, they're just not, you know, they're not helpful. And then I stumbled upon some of what Rourke said. And the idea that he presents about Inland Empire is that maybe the main character in Inland Empire is entirely off screen. And that everything we're watching is essentially, he has a great way of phrasing it. And I can't remember what it is, but it's sort of the, uh, hmm, I wish I could remember what the, the, the quote was. Um, yeah, some type of like fractured delirium or something like the, that. The, yeah, the delirium of, a, of an off screen character that we're mm -hmm. seeing you know the thoughts and the and the and then the constant ideas that are kind of moving through the mind of someone who isn't even on screen and i thought well that really supports the idea that i have about cooper in the return and so obviously if another academic writer who's done their research has discovered or is is proposing an idea grounded in theory I've had another Lynch work, and in fact, the work that came right before the return, mm. that is value. That's a valuable uh, building block that you want to have in place. You want to quote it and say, I'm not the only one who's kind of found my way here. Someone else has about another work, and, you know, it's Lynch. So it's probable that we could apply some of this idea from one work to another, and it just is very supportive of the argument I was making. Yeah. And I was really happy to find that, which is a really hard essay to read. I don't know if you've read it. It's a tough uh, one. Not much. I, I, <clears throat> I jumped around, put it that way. Yeah, yes. sure. Yeah. yeah, it's difficult. And, and there were parts where I wanted to... S well, there were a couple of moments where I was getting a little upset. So <laughs> I jumped around a little bit. But, yeah. but I, I think there was a ton of value, you know? Sure. Yeah. Um, I... I thought, I thought some of, I thought some of it was being crammed into a certain sort of like pre uh, preset framework a little bit, but but the main uh, but the main concept that that I think you borrowed from, or that you found uh, some uh, em empathy with that, that that was a cool part of the essay, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really helped me make sense a little bit of Inland Empire, too, which I yeah. find fascinating. The more I've watched Inland Empire, the more I appreciate it. Um, the first time I saw it was in the theater. Oh, yeah. and I came out. My head was spinning. <laughs> and it was a unique time in my life because I kind of overdosed on Lynch. and okay. We were ending wrapped in plastic. And I was like, I don't want to analyze this. <laughs> so I, I left Inland Empire want one watch you know mm. for years for years but i knew i knew when i was writing about the return that i had to go back to that you know i had to go back and watch it again and and luckily i liked it i, I liked yeah. it even more uh and and i think i watched it a couple of times and like it even more every time i watch it. it i knew i couldn't write about the return without processing that film and then obviously to process that film i had to read what others had written about it. So well, that's, you know, an yeah. interesting that's a that's an interesting, I think, helpful statement. You you just said yes. you just said obviously to process that film, 
I have to read around, you know, and see what others thought about it as well. And uh, that's just an interesting yeah. statement that I, I certainly believe you. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't, one, I don't think everybody other... thinks of it that way, but yeah, that's good. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, that's not true for everyone. You don't have to appreciate yeah. or, or analyze a film uh, that the only way is to go read what people yeah, have yeah, written yeah. about it. But with a work that's challenging like that, you want to... And for me, an essay is something that I might not agree with. I don't think there's a lot in that Rourke essay I probably don't agree with, like you. Um, but I wanted to open some doors. I wanted to get mm. me thinking in a way I hadn't necessarily thought of before. And, and Martha Nockinson's another great example. Martha Nockinson's probably written more academic material about Lynch than any other author. And I disagree with her about a few things. But ne she never fails to make me think about something new. Yeah. And then I take that and go my own way with it. And if I can do anything for anyone, I hope, at the very least, you can disagree with my whole ideas about Twin Peaks, but maybe you'll think of something I never thought of. And it'll open something up for you, which would be fantastic. You know, that's what yeah. you want to do. Yeah, totally. And <laughs> I, I really appreciate that about you. One, I think one of the first exchanges that, that you and I had, I kind of put a generic question out to the yeah. about analysis and right. people's approaches and uh yours was it was somewhat about like just keeping the ball in the air so yes to speak. and uh you know you're gonna you're gonna dip your oar in and hopefully people will find some of it pleasing of course and then but also it's gonna get them thinking yeah. you know and then it just yeah. it just kind of keeps that tennis ball up in the air going and exactly uh, yeah I, I i think credit to you just in my opinion, credit to you for that point of view, was, you know, especially somebody who's really accomplished. Um, can I ask you a little bit about editing? Sure, yes, yeah, do whatever you like. <laughs> I, know you, I know you said that you wrote some words about every single scene in The Return. Almost every like, single scene. <laughs> uh, and once you decided to, to, uh, to use mini essays or essays as interludes, mm -hmm. you just had no room left in the book for a lot of those. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, or you just didn't yeah. think the material was strong enough. Um, was there anything that you wrote, any scenes you wrote about that you cut that you still like? Yes, in fact, I have thought about this. I wish I had, <laughs> I had, I'd spent days and days, I'm serious, I and mean, it took days <laughs> to write about Dougie's first breakfast with Sonny Jim, where he's sitting there and he has his first cup of coffee and the yeah. music is playing and there's the owl cookie jar behind him. Um, I went through that scene literally edit by edit. Mm. I wrote it. I wrote it up. Um, I, I must have just been in the wrong mood when I went back to it all and I read it and I was like, "This is just um, uh, it, it, it's a detour. Don't waste your time on this. Keep people reading, you know, about mm. the, the larger ideas." I wish I kept it in. I, I like it. I, I, when I've gone back and looked at it, it was pretty good. You know, there's I talk about a lot of different things that are going on in that scene. And, um, and so that's, that's one that I cut that I probably cut uh, too impulsively. There are other scenes that I cut for sure that just, you know, I could have spent time, but I, I realized, uh, yeah, it was slowing things down in, in when you're writing about it as a book. I mean, I, I could, I think I wrote about, um, the autopsy of of major briggs and the woodsman coming down the hall and and um i forget what the character's name is who comes from the air force and her role in it and yeah knocks. all of that material embellishes the story but i realized when i was presenting it in a text form that you could leave it out and no one would notice you know and it, and i felt well if you can leave it out and no one will notice i better leave it out so yes, I wrote about it, but I ended up cutting it just to just to keep the book moving. I see, yeah. So, but there are some missing pieces out there. So, to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and not only and not only about the scenes themselves, which I, yeah. I wrote about and just tried again tried to streamline it. Uh, there was a lot of theory. I've said this before. It was stuff mm. I've written about quantum physics, and and um, it was it was weighing the book down. It was it was just too much. So I um, I you know tried to try to make that easier stuff to read and so i took it out yeah. 
Yeah. Is there, um, uh, are there any quantum physics sources or directions you might point somebody in who wants to yeah. explore the return, like through that lens? Because uh, it's interesting. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's compelling. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to step out of frame for two seconds yeah. and grab a book. I'll yeah, show sure. you. So this book it's called Beyond Weird by Philip Ball. I, I read the whole thing and as you can see, I don't know if you can see all the little tabs and yeah. all the notes I took. This, this was really um, the core of my approach to the quantum physics ideas in, um, uh, in, in the Twin Peaks The Return. And again, as I said, so much of it left, but um, the idea of, you know, um, well, yeah, I can't remember what the specific quantum theory was, but this qu uh, QBism, quantum Bayism, the idea that um, you know you can you can influence uh, the effects when you're obs you know, observer effect, the, the idea that when you're observing something you change it, and mm -hmm. how much you change it, and I had a bunch of that material in there, and I think Lynch is somewhat a uh, familiar, very general sense with some of these quantum ideas. And so I wanted to incorporate it and ended up cutting it. But I would recommend this. This was a great book, really readable. And um, I, I would probably go back to that, hopefully write an essay someday about these ideas and Twin Peaks. We'll see. Yeah, cool. Uh, so some of that cut material might surface at some point. Yeah, I, I, maybe. I, I kind of hope so, but yeah. I can't think about it right now. <laughs> have you, this is, this is a random question. Have you ever thought about like the video essay genre, like ever like playing around with that genre? For sure, I did. And, and there oh, was okay. a time uh, before I was writing the book, I thought, well, you know, maybe that's what I was going to do. And um, I just, I'm not savvy enough <laughs> to uh, do it right now. I'm sure I could figure it out and, and mm. do a good job. Um, I did reach out to Ben Durant at Twin Peaks Unwrapped and said, hey, I got these ideas and he was going to help me. But um, but then, you know, uh, honestly, I'm just more comfortable writing and that's yeah. what it was. So, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Um, I'm just going to look at my list of questions for a second. Uh, let's see. Uh, thoughts on the legacy of the return any predictions uh recently i read something you wrote a while ago i guess in the 10-year anniversary of the original series perhaps uh mm -hmm. and you were kind of like uh weighing the weighing the current and potential legacy and i know you've written a bit about the legacy of the return but do you have any thoughts, like a short to long term legacy? Do you feel invested in it at all? Do you feel like uh, you have some role to play, maybe in like legacy <laughs> formation or anything like that? In a I, way, or I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I try not to think about that. I mean, it, it, it's it's a personal thing. I just write about it because I'm excited about it and it, yeah. it, it appealed to me. Um, and people have had some very generous things to say about rap and plastic and, you know, rap and plastic being there when it was before there was an internet kind of mm. keeping Twin Peaks fandom alive, which is very generous thing to say. And I hope that's true. I, but I can't say whether or not uh, it is. Um, uh, I think that, you know, all of David Lynch's work is going to last. He's uh, one of the great movie directors. It's just like Stanley Kubrick. You know, there's kids in college right now who are seeing yeah. 2001 A Space Odyssey for the first time. And they're like, wow, you know, this is amazing. I need to know more about this director. I need to know about this film. Yeah. Some of them it will inspire them to make films. Some of them inspire to write about film. And I think that's true of Twin Peaks and, and Lynch in general. And so Twin Peaks just sort of has this uh, allure, I think, to it because it is a longer work and it has... Um, a lot of moving parts and I think it appeals to, I think there's a I, I've said this before I think there's a always going to be generations to come who will when they especially when they're in college will discover it and want to dive into it and so in that respect the whole work will continue to live the return is a piece of the work and so 
it, it can't be ignored. I mean, I guess people could just stop, you know, with the first two series uh, seasons or whatever. But I think it will live on. I do. I think people will continue to go back to it. the thing about the return is it's 18 hours and it's a it's a big ask. You know, it's not like Firewalk with Me, which is two yeah. and a half hours. This is a commitment. You know, to sit down and watch it. If you're enthused about the work, it's not. You're going to love it. Um, but, but you know, you've got to spend time with it. I, I think I do. I think it'll be around. I think people will co continually come to it and and be in awe of it. Yeah, I think. Do you think it's as amazing as I do? <laughs> <laughs> well um i wrote a whole book about it so. <laughs> uh, i mean i'm not very I, I'm, I'm not like super well read or, or like super like very cultured or like i don't have a lot of film background but i could tell like all right you take what could be done what could be done what could be experimented with in a film you got you got point of view you got setting time characterization uh uh, symbolism and, and you could list 10 more things and it seems like genre and it seems like if something was there to be experimented with or played with not not just for the sake of playing but you know like purposefully it was it was like almost anything that could be uh, manipulated or, or done it seems like it was done in the return the first series too but I think even more so in the return I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think, and I think a lot of that is due to Mark Frost's uh, influence yeah. as well. You know, Frost is a little more uh, forensic and a little more, um, um, I guess, he, he's inter interested, perhaps, he, he's certainly interested in the occult, but some of the science fictional aspects and trying to p put pieces together and, and make them make sense. And certainly he knows a narrative and how to yeah. drive a narrative. So, um, so a lot of the genre elements probably came in f more because of him than, than Lynch necessarily. But um, and that's a fascinating thing about the Twin Peaks throughout, with the exception perhaps of Firewalk Me, is that you had two very, very powerfully creative individuals, but each with different sensibilities coming together. And um, at, at some times it's sort of like the, you know, the, you know I'm, I'm going to get this, you know, a wave is in sync with another wave. I forget what the terminology is, but um, when when the two waves synced up, Lynch and Frost, it was it was brilliance beyond compare. But then, when the two waves were in opposition, it was also brilliant, but for different reasons because they were, I think, sometimes working at odds, and yeah. that opened a whole bunch of doors to interpretation. So, so anyway, uh, yeah, I think. Uh, you know, it, it, there is a lot packed into the overall work. And it is, there's so, well, I mean, books and books and books have been yeah. written about different parts of, of Twin Peaks. So I, I don't know how many books of essays I'm looking at my bookshelf, uh, you know, uh, and that started back in the early 90s. You know, there were, there were books being written about all different ways of taking the show apart. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's I love I love the idea of two people who are high high level operators, but very different, and probably they probably clash on a lot of things, a lot a lot of like life or social issues, but with the respect for each other's skill set, and just you know respect for each other's humanity to work together, and uh, you know I I love that type of synthesis when it happens. Um, I'm gonna quote you. And uh -oh. <laughs> And then I'm going to ask you if you'd like to say a bit more. <laughs> um, so you said Twin Peaks can be revelatory, not only about what we see in it, but also about what we see in ourselves. And is there anything you'd like to say more to that? Maybe you already have, but. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I kind of talked a little bit about yeah. this early on when I started studying it and, and, and didn't know a lot about can I, can I, can I, I'm sorry, can I just add one little extra quote to that? Of course. Uh, um, including the idea of reconstituting oneself. So Did I say that? Yeah, okay, sorry, but that, that was probably some Cooper stuff. Um, on my list of questions, it follows, it follows uh, some Red Room talk where Cooper perhaps is undergoing a long 
process of maybe like put, maybe in some way putting himself back together or or, or as I constituting said, himself or rehabilitating yeah. himself which is the word i use um do, do we all, do we all are we all in the red room at some point <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, I mean, that's a good um, philosophical existential question, yeah. <laughs> I think. Um, sure. I mean, you know, Cooper's predicament on a more metaphoric level, uh, the idea of us struggling with our place in the world and who we are and the consequences of our actions and the goals we want to achieve. Certainly studying the return made me think about a lot of those ideas in my own life, without a doubt. And so that's what I'm talking about in terms of revelatory, in terms of what we see in ourselves. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, it's kind of, a, that's kind of the answer is yeah. right there. Uh, I, I, I did think about, and, and, you know, writing the book itself, um, you know, why am I writing this book? And um, I'm not going to make money writing this book. <laughs> you know, it's not, you don't make money writing Twin Peaks books. Um, and then I'm like, well, do I want people to, you know, you know, think differently of me and you know you realize all of that goes away early on mm -hmm. these are silly thoughts that you have in your head but as you get further into the project you realize i am writing this for me i'm writing this because i want to do it i need to do it and uh, i don't really worry any you know i think lynch has actually said stuff like this too you do it for the doing mm -hmm. you know you don't do it for any other reason and um and so the process of writing changes you a little bit, makes you think about yourself. Uh, I would say that about any art, any project that you're doing. Um, you, you don't want to lose sight necessarily or get blinded perhaps by um, extraneous uh, ideas and thoughts of what the, what the book is about or what the art, the painting you're doing. It, it's about that, about that process of just sort of um, expressing yourself. And, and that, uh, that I think is the most important thing. Yeah, that's, that's well said. And uh, I know you've said a couple of times and I think maybe also in the book that th this, was a, this book was very much an act of self-expression as well, including like the publishing of it, the, uh, the design of it, the involvement of family. And if, and if you don't want to talk about family, that's fine. But it was, it was interesting to me to say, to see how much you credited your wife, I think at the end, and uh, and uh, do you want to say anything about like maybe the role she played for you? Sure, um, um, absolutely. I um, well, first of all, she helped me get the photo for the cover. <laughs> so that was that was critically important. She held the flashlight, and uh, and it, you know it's a crazy story. But we went out in the middle of the night to a remote spot outside of Dallas because I knew I could get this picture and. She, she was there with me. Um, but well, she was a huge help. I mean, just a massive help. I, I honestly, there were times where when it comes to some of the, uh, the nitty gritty technical aspects of publishing the book or formatting the book, I would get frustrated with Word, which isn't always as, as nimble as you want it to be for moving it into uh, a, a PDF to publish on, on Amazon. Um, she would come in and rescue me uh, over and over again and figure out what I thought was just impossible. I, I can't get the footnotes to work. You know? And I really wanted it to be formatted a very specific way. I wanted to have those footnotes at the bottom of the page. I wanted them to kind of be a second commentary on the work. And, uh, and so anyway, um, she solved all those problems for me. But then more than that, she did a, uh, a, uh, she was one of a few people who did a copy edit on mm -hmm. the book. And um, I can distinctly remember, uh, I, I was, I wanted to be done. <laughs> I said, I, I want to push, there's a button you can push and you publish it. I said, I want to go push that button. I just want to push it. And she started reading it and found some typos. And I was like, oh, you know, and then she committed herself to reading it and, and found a whole bunch of mistakes that I was blind to. Uh, and so, if the book is any good, uh, a lot of it I owe to her, without a doubt. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm not I'm not too smart, but I, I have some expertise in grammar, and and I I noticed maybe like two typos through like 220 pages, which is that's like miraculous. <laughs> so credit to everybody that was involved in the in the copy editing. 
Yeah, I, I, well, that's good news because uh, the first book has a lot more. You'll probably notice, <laughs> without a doubt. Um, but that was a whole different situation. Um, yeah, well, I, I'm glad. I'm glad that was one of the things because I, you know, I got criticism, and when I say criticism, I mean there were reviews of the first book that said, "Well, uh, you know, the typos made me laugh," and I, I tried to embrace that and say, yeah. "Yes, I know about that." Um, Craig Miller was my editor when we were doing Round of Blasting, yeah. and he often caught uh, so much of those takes, and, and he wasn't around, and I did that book, and there, really no one else but me did that book, so any yeah. errors in there are certainly mine. Um, so it makes me happy to know that the new book <laughs> that was really important to me was to make it okay, good. better in that regard. So Yeah, I mean, and then the, I mean, the prose, the sentences is just, it's great, and, you know, there's, there's, no doubt about it. The guy can write. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, um, that, I really like to hear that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have maybe like just two more questions. And one of them actually, is there anybody else that was in the acknowledgments sec section of your book that you uh, that you wouldn't mind like maybe expanding on a little bit? So maybe saying a few more words beyond the acknowledgement? And by all means, uh, just pass if you want to pass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow, everybody in there I, uh, was important to me. Um, Jeff Lemire was the first person I mentioned. He is a comic book writer. He's gotten some fame with some of his work has been made into television series and stuff. And he was a fan of Wrapped in Plastic before he became Jeff Lemire. And um, he said some very nice things to me, some very nice things, uh, which really, really, I, I said this in the book. I'm like, wow, you know, um, I, I, I want to please him, <laughs> you know, I want to, I want to, uh, I want to, he inspired me. And so uh, he would read some of my essays before anyone else and, and gave me such enthusiastic feedback. I was just like, wow, okay, maybe I, I can do this. Um, but, you know, everybody, uh, Scott Ryan was a big help. I mean, you know, Scott's got an online personality, but, uh, you know, people see him, yeah. it's kind of, you're making jokes and stuff, but, um, you know, he, he gets things done. And he helped yeah. me help me work on that. Um, yeah, I was just, anyway, I was just I don't curious. Know. No, 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 you did you did find, you did a good job in the acknowledgments. I was just curious. Yeah, if, uh, if, uh, that that guy, uh, I think his name is Bo. Somebody like typed up the whole transcript from season three. Uh, uh, Bo Monarch. Uh, yeah, just somebody who <laughs> there was. A, so what happened there was you know these these uh, audio. Um, I forget what they're called, uh, what the, 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 the name of these, these files that were sent out, I think it was during Emmy season or something, um, that uh, you know, basically had all the dialogue and continuity. And it was, it, they came out and you know, one day he tweeted, hey, I turned it into, the first one into a script format, mm. which was amazing. Yeah, I know, looked yeah. through, it was like having a script. <clears throat> and he, would, he did them all. He did all to 18 hours. I printed them out and I have, you know, used them. So uh, yeah, I made sure to uh, to acknowledge him, and, and it is funny because I contacted him privately, and um, I'll just share this part. I don't think he realized because years had passed. <laughs> I yeah, think he okay. knew, and he was like, "Wow, you know, uh, you know, the universe does, you know, have you know, uh, there's karmic payoff for yeah, all that yeah, work yeah. I did," uh, and um, so yeah, he he did he did a great job. That was really neat thing that he did um so, yeah, I, know, and, and I, know I, a, I know there's a lot of people who would love to have access to something like that uh just just because it's yeah. so convenient and uh yeah and I, I think they're still available um there's a link somewhere oh, okay. i don't i'll, 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 I'll see yeah. what i can find out and yeah. see if I'll other people can maybe. yeah yeah because yeah. <laughs> um i'm gonna just ask one more thing about you that maybe you won't want to answer, maybe. <laughs> uh, well, like I said, I, I started in 2020, like in my mid 30s, uh -huh. which is maybe a little weird to come to this show that late, but it, it grabbed me and it hasn't let go. Um, so a lot of the information that I've gathered, you know, outside the text, re podcasts and, and reading and whatnot, um, a, lot of people's, a lot of people's perspective was sort of established you know like there's some common talk there's sort of like a maybe some canonical interpretations 
of the original series and maybe less so for the return firewalk with me as well are there any things that you have written that you believe have kind of become like sort of a part of the interpretive canon <laughs> and secondly is there anything that you think will uh, in the new book uh well i hope the laura palmer thing you know people who've read it seem to think um hey that I, I didn't realize that it, it, it makes some sense. I see this fitting, you know, uh, clarifying elements of the return. So I, I hope that if anything, you know, people will will um, at least look into some of those ideas. Maybe they'll mm -hmm. see something else. But um, uh, I, I mean, I wrote an essay about Cooper as a dreamer in Firewalk with Me, and you, I don't know if you're familiar with that, yeah. but um, um, that was controversial at the time. I remember getting letters at Wrapped in Plastic, and they were people were mad. They were like literally mad. Okay, I would have suggested this. It's like, well, it doesn't mean it's right. I mean, it's just a, it just some made sense to me, and I I I really like that idea, and I think there's a lot of, of uh, data to, to support it in the text and outside of the text. Um, so, but I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have, I, I don't think I necessarily. Is, is there anything you think, <laughs> is there anything you think uh, will not last? Like even, even though you love it, like it's just gonna be, it's not gonna last when people continue talking about the return, like any takes that you had. Oh, stuff that I've written? Yeah, like on the um, return. That you think maybe you think it was cool but you just think people are or, or, or maybe I could say this differently <clears throat> do you have any really good critics or, or uh, anybody who's like well, I'll tell you what. your ideas pushed back or maybe taking them in a different direction and and sorry I keep talking but sure I think you were saying maybe to Jeremiah maybe not but you, you kind of want that is from what I heard well I are you getting it I value reason, good criticism and, yeah. and something and more than just, I don't like it. Or, and yeah. this is what I got when I wrote this Fire Walk With Me essay. Like, well, how dare you? And oh, Jeff okay. a real character. It's like, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but if you, you know, if you want to um, give me a, another theory, I, I probably would embrace, you know, other theories. I think theories yeah. can coexist. Um, yeah, same. But, you know, there was somebody who wrote a criticism. I wrote about Laura Palmer and uh, her, um, it's, in, it's in the first book, uh, the realization of Laura Palmer, what Laura Palmer goes through, her, her trauma. And um, I wrote about that when I was probably 30 something years old, a, a white male writing about the trauma of a woman having been abused. And uh, I read some criticism from someone who took me to task for some of the terminology I used. And um, I really made me think, I, did, I didn't get it. I, 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 don't, I didn't truly understand necessarily what, what Laura went through. Um, I you know, was approaching it from my very, very narrow point of view and, um, and I, I value that. I value. I've never been in contact with that critic. It was someone online, mm. and uh, but whoever they are out there, you know, and they were taking me to task a little bit too. They were, you know, they were kind of reprimanding me, <laughs> and uh, and and I think perhaps right, rightly so. I I said, you know, I said something like, Laura has gone through a trauma that is the worst thing that could ever happen to anyone, and. And, and this was a woman who was writing the criticism and, and uh, you know, they said something like, you know, why would he use terms like that? And I, and I guess I realized, uh, you know, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't the right person to say those things. So, I, I, so criticism like that is important. And I try to keep, I will say when I, when I wrote this book, I had that in, uh, some of that in mind. I realized, who am I? as you know, 50 year old uh, white male writing about some of these ideas, um, whether they're religious ideas or whether they're feminist uh, ideas um, 
or any number of other things. I, I, I want to be careful to, to, um, to at least acknowledge uh, other, other points of view and, and, not, and not make blanket statements about certain things. I guess that's where I've grown somewhat as a writer, realize that, um, yeah, no, I, I only know what I know. <laughs> and, and to assume that what I know is, 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 is uh, applicable to everybody else is, is wrong. Uh, so, so I, I tried to open my mind that way. Mm, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I would offer that that's got to be one of the worst things anybody can go through. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I say that without hesitation, without apology, but well, I, I can't I, imagine I, I, anything much worse than that. Well, I'm mischaracterizing perhaps yeah. what I said and what the person no, said. I, 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 think I, said I, I think I said something like, you shouldn't, it was un, you, unrecoverable or you, there was no way back from this. Mm. And, and, and they took me to task for that. I, I, I apologize. I can't remember what it was, which yeah, is awful because here I am talking about it. But, but I know we go back and look, you know, but, but they, I said something like that, like you, you can't recover from what happened. And, and, yes, and, yes. and they, they said, well, you know, that, well, why are you using that kind of terminology? And then, and they were right. They were right. Yeah. I think, I think that's very interesting because when you have that idea of that something can't be recovered from, you know, then, then, then the person is not only victimized by the event or, you know, by the victimizer, but, the, but, but then they're victimized by the fact that it happened. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I, I just think it's an interesting topic because so, so, somebody can damage somebody else and, and there, like there lies, there, therein lies the crime, et cetera, of, in all, in all types, you know, moral, mm -hmm. et cetera. But do they, do they get to keep committing that crime forever? You know, like sort of in, right. in your body's memory, in your, in your memory, you know, and it's. Uh, right. And that's, I think that's what I realized that, that, you know, uh, in a writing, in terms of writing, I probably just toss that off. You know, the criticism yeah. of the con, the criticism of the content is, is extremely valid, and and um, certainly something I've considered and gone back and looked at. But there was there was something else happening as well. It wasn't just the words I used. It was the fact that I probably wrote it pretty fast. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. It didn't, and didn't go back and think about it a little more. I just tossed it off, and so. They weren't critiquing me for that, but I'm critiquing me for that. And, yeah, and, I, and, and so in this book, I really did, I really tried to think about everything I wrote. And I'm sure there's instances where I wrote something quickly and, and, and maybe I didn't give it the full thought, but, but that was a valuable lesson to learn. And someone critiqued me and, and um, I took it to heart. The, uh, <laughs> the, Thanks for sharing that. The, the other critiques you get are, uh, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, maybe it'll work this time. Oh my God, <laughs> that's my daughter. That's an interesting critique. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, it's like, really, tell me what you really think. Um, okay, so some of, the, some of the critiques that you just said you get, and I could imagine are, you know, sometimes you say some crazy, crazy sounding stuff that it's like it's like no way but the fun of reading your work at least for me is like you know this is pretty out there and then you get to the end of it you know you get to the end of your sort of explanation or and it's like okay this is not that crazy anymore and that's just something I happen to like I think it's sort of impressive but I could imagine you getting like you know for like the uh, dreams of deer meadow concept mm -hmm. Um, you, you read you read the first couple of paragraphs and you're like mm, I don't think so and then you keep right. reading it and you follow the argument and uh, it gets you somewhere good so anyway that's that's more of maybe my interpretation of some things that you do but here we have Lynchian and you took a stab at it uh, <laughs> you, you decided to add a little more I think than like the traditional sort of Lynchian thing. Do you want to say anything about this or not really? 
Uh, well, I mean, the thing I think that ha having read a lot about David Lynch and his art and in interviews that he's done, um, and then obviously studying the return to so, such a depth, um, I really do believe that, that you know, that Lynch is, uh, and he's interested in, in communication so much that he is kind of asking us to participate with him in, in making sense of his work. That, and he said this before, you know, um, whatever you read into it is valid. And, and some people find that kind of like, well, it's sort of trite, you know, mm. come on, tell us what it means. And I, I don't think it, it's trite. I think he is saying, you know, we're working on this some, it, to some level, we're working on this together. And, and uh, I've left it open enough for you to come in and bring some of yourself to the work. And so if it, if it means something to you that I never intended, and Mark Frost has said this too, so it's not just Lynch. Yeah. If it means something to you, or if you're seeing it in a way that I never intended or didn't think about, that's still valid. It's not like you're wrong. You can't tell, you can't tell someone who's experiencing art that their experience is wrong. I mean, it's just, it's just not true. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's completely valid, whatever you said. The only thing I guess I would say is, um, you know, I, I guess what I dismiss is when someone tells you you're wrong about something and they're there and, and they just sort of, you know, they, or they don't like your theory um, and, they, and they don't attempt to at least explain why they don't like it. I mean, yeah. it's one thing that, you know, anyway, I, I, it gets, it gets, <laughs> it, it gets, uh, um, gets under one skin vague and obscure, but anyway. Uh, this is a half joking question, but you want to take a stab about it? Uh, wow. That is crazy. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I probably already, already did, uh, with you. And that is that idea that, um, um, that, hopefully you will think of, of of the work maybe i can open a door for you that i never thought of before i again something that i had had tweeted to you a, a while back yeah. and and we talked about earlier in this conversation um i i don't know if that's something exclusive to me by any means i mean there's a lot of great critics out there who uh who are successful i think because they not only get you thinking in the way that they their thoughts um but they get you thinking in ways that they never intended mm. and so that that's what i i mean i certainly want to convince or at least compel you to my ideas you know i want to try to support my ideas but um i also do hope that you know it opens some doors that i never thought of you know, yeah, so cool. uh, stumbling through that <laughs> answer for you. Yeah. Well, if, uh, <laughs> if if anybody, if anybody aside from my mom watches this, then I, <laughs> yeah, I'll, right. I'll, I'll throw that question out to a, a wider audience too, because that might be interesting just to see how other people might uh, might might uh, respond to that. You know. With, yeah, with, with, I, I will say to you. I mean, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know what your perception of it is, but it's not like I have a huge reader base. It's not like there's a, you know, teeming uh, of people who hang on every word I write, but by any means, you know, it's a very, Twin Peaks itself is extremely limited. And then writing about yeah. Twin Peaks is, is, you know, a further subset. And then unfortunately um, a great many of the Twin Peaks fans uh, dropped off because they just weren't interested in, in the return. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, there's a very narrow audience there. And I, and I I was well aware of that when I was writing. Yeah. Well, that worked out for me. So. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. Yeah. Well, I uh, I got to thank you again, and uh, it's it's really a pleasure. And, Good. Well, same here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I hope you enjoyed. I did. I did, and I I, I enjoyed the the things that you put out on on Twitter. You know, I uh, I guess I found you because you were you were anal uh. Um, breaking down the structure the sentence structure of, of, of that and um i would often look at them as puzzles because i couldn't do yeah. <laughs> but it was teaching me about some grammar that i you know i i've forgotten since grade school 
So, and then, uh, you know, obviously you were, uh, you're very enthused <laughs> about the work. So uh, I was drawn to your enthusiasm. Yeah, thanks. Well, once again, I, I appreciate it and I hope you have a great day. So. Yes, yes, yeah. me too. All right, we'll be in thanks. touch. Cool. All right. All right, okay. thanks, man. Take care. You bet, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.